Welcome back to the short video series on the periodic quantum mechanics methodology. In the last video, we began to detail the various approximations that are typically applied to solid state modeling. Let us continue with part two here. In order to understand what further approximations can be made, let us take a look at the actual form of the wave function. For this purpose, let us try to understand how the lattice periodicity influences the mathematical description of the wave function. Further, let us understand how the wave function is related to the concept of reciprocal space, which we may have heard about before. To simplify, let us go from a 3D representation to a one-dimensional representation of the lattice. This 1D lattice consists of a string of atoms evenly spaced along x, with a lattice constant of a. Each atom is representative of one primitive unit cell in our 1D crystal. Instead of looking at an infinitely long string, which would mean a lot of atoms, we can apply periodic boundary conditions. The best way to imagine periodic boundary conditions is to think not of a straight line of atoms, but of a ring where the atoms are still separated by the lattice constant A. If we move on the ring, we will, after n steps, arrive at the start again. As such, we will never reach an end of the string. In the 3D case, this would mean that if we leave the crystal on one side, we enter it again on the other side. In this way, we exclude surface effects and thus can calculate bulk properties while only using small structures. Let us zoom into a section of the circle. Since the atoms are arranged periodically, the potential, V of R, is also periodic. This means that the potential, at a certain point R, is equal to the potential at a point which lies a translational vector, along x, away from r. The potential has some arbitrary shape from the interatomic forces. Here, for ease of visualization, let us consider a square wave function as the potential. From mathematics, we may know that we can represent any periodic function by a Fourier series, which is a sum of sine and cosine waves. However, instead of writing sine and cosine functions, we can also use the equivalent exponential form of such plane waves. These plane waves depend on some vector g and have a prefactor u. In this notation, we sum over different g vectors indicated by the subscript m. Let's see how these plane waves can represent our square wave potential. If we start with one plane wave, which is equivalent to one g vector in our sum, we see that the periodic function goes up and down at the right spots, but is not yet a good approximation. If we add together two plane waves, we already come a little bit closer to the actual function. If we make a huge jump and sum up 500 plane waves, we see that we are already very close to the final solution. From this simple consideration, we learn that we can reasonably approximate any function by the sum of a finite number of plane waves. This means that we can define a cutoff g vector beyond which our approximated function hardly changes, or at least only changes in a way which is negligible for our purposes. We'll use this knowledge later in this video again, but we will first try to answer what kind of g vector should we use in the sum of plane waves? Are there any restrictions? In order to answer this question, let us see which condition has to be fulfilled by our plane waves. We remember that the function value at r must be equal to the function value at r plus the translational vector of the lattice, capital R. This equation can only be satisfied if the exponential of i times the product of gm and the translational lattice parameter r equals 1. Interestingly, all the g vectors that meet this criterion form a lattice, which is called the reciprocal lattice. In one dimension, we end up with a string of points, but this time separated by 2 pi over a. The g vectors, which form the lattice, are called reciprocal lattice vectors and are comparable with the translational vectors Rn in the real lattice. The same is true for two or three dimensions. Similar to the real lattice, we can define a unit cell in the reciprocal lattice, which is spanned by the primitive reciprocal lattice vectors. The reciprocal lattice of a cubic lattice is also a cubic lattice. The same is true for the hexagonal lattice, but the primitive lattice vectors are different. In summary, the reciprocal lattice contains all vectors that are in accordance with the periodicity of the real lattice. Similar to the potential, we see that the wave function follows the periodicity of the lattice. That is, it has to satisfy the translational symmetry of the lattice, 
This suggests that we can approximate the electron wave functions, psi k, also by an expansion in plane waves. However, the wave function has to fulfill a second condition, the periodic boundary condition. Let's again assume that we have a 1D lattice, where every atom represents a primitive unit cell. We further apply periodic boundary conditions, which means that if we walk along the lattice vector A, we would reach our starting point again after n steps. For the wave function, this means that the values of the wave function at the starting point and after n times a lattice constant have to be equal. If we think about the size of the circle as the size of the crystal, and imagine that we would approach the complete crystal if n goes to infinity, we understand that fulfilling the periodic boundary conditions means that the wave function has to be periodic on the sample or macroscopic length scale. So the wave function has to have translational symmetry and meet the periodic boundary condition. A function that fulfills both requirements is very well known and is called the block function. As suggested, the block function is an expansion of plane waves. However, this time, the function not only depends on the reciprocal lattice vector g, but also on a vector k, which is sometimes called the crystal momentum vector. We can rewrite the equation such that the last expression is strictly periodic with the lattice, and the exponential term only depends on k. If we take a closer look at both vectors, we clearly recognize the yellow marked expression from the expansion of the potential. Indeed, the g vectors are again the reciprocal lattice vectors, which span the reciprocal space. Since we know the g's already, we can concentrate on the k vectors. If we apply the periodic boundary conditions to the block function and perform a little bit of math, we find out that k cannot be an arbitrary number. k is restricted to be an integer s divided by n, the number of unit cells in the ring, and multiplied by the primitive lattice vector b. Since this equation is true for all three dimensions, we can add an additional index i, representative for the directions x, y, and z. If we calculate the values of k for a specific n, we recognize that all values lie in the green region between negative pi i over a and pi i over a of the reciprocal lattice. This special region is called the Brillouin zone and is a primitive cell of the reciprocal lattice. The construction of the Brillouin zone is relatively easy, even in three dimensions. You have to choose one point in reciprocal space, let's say the origin at 0, 0, as demonstrated here in 2D. Then you search for the nearest neighbors and draw a vertical line that bisects the connecting line of the two neighbors. The area that is enclosed by the verticals represents the first Brillouin zone. How many discrete k points are actually in the first Brillouin zone? This can be answered by looking at the formula again. The number of k-points in the first Brillouin zone is equal to the number of primitive unit cells n included in the crystal, or in our example, the number of atoms along the ring. If we increase n, we decrease the distance between the k-points and therefore increase the amount of k-points in the first Brillouin zone. If we go to a very large n, let's assume 10 to the 23rd or more, we almost have a continuum of values. What about the k-points outside of the first Brillouin zone? All these k-points can be transformed into a representative k-point in the Brillouin zone by symmetry, as for instance, by adding or subtracting a reciprocal lattice vector from k. Said differently, the wave function with k prime is equal to the wave function at k, and we will not gain any further information by including the wave function with k prime. Even some k-points in the first Brillouin zone can be reducible by symmetry, which means that the k-points can be transformed into one another by symmetry. Only the four yellow vectors are relevant in our specific example. The black ones can be generated by adding or subtracting a reciprocal lattice vector. If we take the cubic lattice as an example, we see that we actually only have to consider the k-points that are in the triangle formed by the points gamma, m, and x. This triangle is called the irreducible Brillouin zone. Later, we will see that the reduction of k-points can be tremendously helpful to reduce the computational cost. Until now, we learned that there are two vectors, g and k, which define the wave function. We understood that g is determined by the lattice symmetry, and that k can only be chosen from the first Brillouin zone in the reciprocal lattice. However, where do we see the effect of k in our picture of the wave function? If we take a closer look at the function, 
we see that it is modulated by an envelope curve shown here in orange. That is where the exponential of i times the product of k and x comes into play. We see that this function is periodic on the sample length scale rather than the atomic length scale. Let us try to understand what this modulation means practically. Let's look again at a 1D crystal, where every atom represents a unit cell. Sometimes it can be helpful to think of the k value as the phase of the wave function. If we use this figure, we can imagine different extreme scenarios. These two extreme scenarios are shown here, namely the case where k is equal to 0 and the case where k is equal to pi i over a. If k is equal to 0, the phase of the wave function is the same in every unit cell. In turn, if k equals pi i over a, we have opposite phases in neighboring cells. What does this mean for the energy of the state, psi k? The energies depend on the exact value of k. If we plot all the energy values as a function of k along a certain direction of the reciprocal space, we end up with a band structure. The band structure is an important and often calculated property in the field of solid state physics. Let us come back to the definition of the block function one more time. If we look at the first expression, we see that we only include plane waves in our expansion, here represented as a circle, which depend on a specific k, here k1, or a vector, which differs only by a reciprocal lattice vector g from this k. We can do that for every k value in the first Brillouin zone. Now the question arises, how many plane waves do we need in our expansion? Similar to the representation of the periodic potential with a Fourier series, we can truncate the expansion of the wave function if we reach an appropriate accuracy level. Thus, we will have to choose this value for every calculation and every system carefully. We can think of the cutoff value as a circle in 2D or a sphere in 3D, where we only use plane waves with a k plus g which are included in the circle or sphere. We will learn in the last video how we can decide if we have chosen the right cutoff value. However, we have to keep in mind that although the calculations become more accurate with increasing cutoff, they also take longer to finish. Let's review what we have covered so far. We can apply DFT, make use of the crystal periodicity, and introduce a cutoff for the expansion of the wave function. We see that with these approximations, the calculations become more and more efficient. However, we have not yet reached our final goal. Let us find out if we can use more approximations. For this purpose, let us return to the k values in the reciprocal space. Some interesting properties that we calculate with density functional theory depend on the integral of the wave function over reciprocal space. One famous example is the electron density at a certain position r. This density is calculated by an integration of the wave function squared over the Brillouin zone, weighted by a factor f. Although we can already significantly reduce the number of necessary k points at which the cone sham wave functions have to be calculated through symmetry considerations, calculating the electron density at all remaining k points would still be a lot of computational work. However, since the lattice periodic part of the block function does not change tremendously with k, we can use far fewer k points to calculate the Brillouin zone integral and transform the integral into a sum. The k points that are used for this task are often called special k points, and their exact coordinates in reciprocal space depend on the symmetry of the real crystal structure. We see again that while defining a representative k point grid, symmetry plays an important role. For large structures, the number of used k points can be as small as 1. However, accurate calculations often need more than 1. These days, there are efficient algorithms that determine the special k points automatically. The user only has to give two inputs, the density of the grid, and if one wants to integrate high symmetry points or not. Excluding high symmetry points is often done by a simple shift of the grid in reciprocal space. A guide on how to choose an appropriate grid density will be shown in the next video. We see that with clever k-point sampling, the computational effort can be reduced even more. There is one final approximation that will help make the DFT calculations feasible. This approximation is called the pseudo-potential approach. The pseudo-potential approach arises from the question of whether or not every electron has to be modeled concretely. More specifically, it is a way to exclude the core electrons in atoms, which often hardly influence the material properties. Tightly bound core states are difficult to describe accurately by plane waves, and would unnecessarily increase the number of plane waves in the expansion of the wave function.
Furthermore, the valence electron wave functions would strongly oscillate in the core region. In the pseudopotential approximation, the core electrons and the strong ionic potential are replaced by a pseudopotential, which acts on smooth pseudo wave functions without any oscillations in the core region. Outside of the core region, the pseudo electron and all electron approach correspond to each other. A last look at our general scale indicates that these approximations help us solve a complex computational problem. Of course, this video is not a rigorous introduction to all of the theory behind periodic quantum mechanical calculations. Outside of this course, a detailed description of the theory can be found in many textbooks. Good examples, especially for the mathematical background and references used for this video are shown here. On the right, Hoffman offers a didactic overview of solid state modeling in solids and surfaces, a chemist's view of extended bonding. In this video, we introduce the five major approximations which are utilized in periodic quantum mechanical calculations, DFT, lattice periodicity, truncation of the expansion of the wave function, a discrete set of k-points, as well as the pseudo-potential approach. In the next video, we'll discuss the application of this method. See you there.